Hold in big space, small and young go. That's maybe that one means. The rest of us, we are going to open up our Bibles to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, probably one of the greatest and most well-known verses in the Bible, John 3.16, probably if, and I hope you have been working on scripture memorization, this is probably one of the very first verses that you memorize, John 3.16. We're going to spend the next several weeks going through this verse, uh, really just trying to unpack the truth. Uh, Advent is about uh, the coming of Christ, right? Advent is about celebrating Christ's coming, his arrival here. And, and what we want to do as we look at John 3.16 is we want to look at four kind of truths uh, surrounding the advent of Jesus Christ. Four, four truths that help us understand in a deeper and, and more uh, appropriate way the coming of Christ, or we might say the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we're going we're gonna to start today by discussing uh, why Christ has come in the first place. Like why, why did Jesus come? Uh, the following week we're going to talk about the driving force behind his coming. Uh, the third week, we're going to talk about uh, the way in which Christ came. And then on Easter, Easter, <laughs> we're going to wait all the way to Easter to finish, just so you know. We're going to keep you in suspense. It's like a giant cliffhanger. Uh, no, on Christmas Eve, in our Christmas Eve service, we're going to finish up and we're going to discuss our connection to Christ. And, and the end purpose in Christ's coming. So I pray that these next several weeks will be for us as a church, just a fruitful time and encouraging time as we seek to just better understand the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so with that being said, why don't we, um, why don't we pray to start our time together, all right? Father in heaven, we come before you and we just, uh, Lord, we praise you and we thank you for this morning, we thank you for the opportunity to sit under the word, Lord, and we come and we collectively confess, Father, that faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that our ears would be attentive to your word. And Lord, not, not that ears would be attentive to what I have to say, Father, for I have very little to say, but that our ears would be attentive to what you have to say, God, because you have much to say to us. And Lord, we confess that listening to you and hearing you is of the greatest importance in our lives. We think of the words that you spoke to Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you speak the same to us. Hear, O church. Hear the word of the Lord. For man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so I pray, Father, that our ears would be attentive to your word this morning. That our hearts would be attentive to your word this morning. God, that you in your grace and your mercy and your kindness and your compassion, that you would work through the power of your Holy Spirit to change us and transform us. Through the power of your word, through the power of your spirit, work within us. I pray that you bring conviction. I pray that you bring uh, repentance. I pray that you bring deeper faith and, and reliance upon Christ as our Lord and Savior. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I said over the next several weeks, we're going to kind of look at John 3.16 and seek to uh, kind of unpack it and understand it more concerning the coming of Christ and what it means for us. And so this week, this stand is ridiculous, uh, we're going to uh, we're going to start by considering why it is that Christ had to come in the first place. And when I think about the question why, or or why questions, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming more and more convinced that, that there's kind of uh, no question that's almost more central to our, our humanity than the question why. Right? I think why just kind of drives everything, almost everything we do. Um, you know, I have four kids, so I, I think I can speak with, with some experience uh, on this, or some kind of uh, sense of uh, a position of authority, not authority maybe, but I have four. Um, one of the first words kids learn is no. Uh, interestingly enough, nobody has to teach them that word. Uh, it's like uh, they come pre-programmed, you know? It's like when you buy a new computer or a new phone, you know how it comes preloaded with software, some kind of weird stuff on it, right? Well, kids, they only come preloaded with one thing, and it's like the word no. And nobody teaches them that, they just, it just naturally flows out of them. But shortly after no, one of the other words that they learn is, is the word why. Right? They, they learn why, and, and once they learn what why means, and once they learn how to use why, they use it all the time. Right? They question everything. Right? Why, why do I have to go to bed? Right? Why can't I stay up? Why can't I touch the hot stove? Why can't I run across the street? Why can't I ride my bike today? Why can't I have more chocolate? Why do I have to eat my vegetables? It's why, 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 why? All the time, asking why, right? And, and the funny thing is, is that it, it doesn't change as we progress into adulthood, right? We continue to ask the question why. 
Right? How many of us, when we're sitting in high school, we sit there and go, why do I need calculus? Like, what's the purpose of calculus? Right? Like, it's not like I'm going to someday be in the, the grocery store and I'm going to be trying to choose between, uh, you know, like cornflakes or Cheerios based upon, you know, their projected limits of impossibilities and par parabolas and hyperbolas and things. You know, you're just going to you, addition. That's easy, right? Why do we need calculus, right? Why do we need physics? I'm not a rocket scientist. I don't, I don't send things into space. Why do I need physics, right? Why do I have to pay taxes? What is it doing for me? I don't like taxes. Why do I have to pay taxes? Why do I have to eat my vegetables? Right? We still ask that one. Why do, I, why do I have to go to bed now? I don't want to go to bed now. I'm an adult. Why? We ask why all the time. Right? Why is just so exciting. It's kind of central to who we are. We question things and we want to know why. And, and here's the reason. I, I think, this is me, I think we want to know why. Because we attach such value to the answer to that question. We, we want to know why, because for us, the answer becomes this measuring rod by which we determine the importance or the value of the thought, the idea, or the action, or the issue at hand, right? And, and here's what I believe. I believe that, that for us, if the why is great enough, and the why is personal enough, then, then the issue, the thought, the action, the whatever it is, it becomes important to us, Right? It begins to take on value to us. So much so that if the why isn't great enough, if it's not personal enough, we, we kind of push that thing aside and, and we devalue it, right? So, so you did that with calculus probably. You devalued calculus, right? Some, some people do it with vegetables, which is a bad idea actually. Uh, vegetables, you should eat your vegetables. Uh, we'll go into why later, but you should just eat your vegetables. Just take it from me. Eat your vegetables, right? So when we consider why Christ came, what we find out is that, is that the answer is, of, of, uh, it's, it's so great and, and so vastly personal and important to us that, that it demands our attention. And, and the why of why Jesus came is he came because all of us, all of us are in great, great danger. And, and not that kind of cool danger, right? That makes you want to go out and bungee jump. Not that kind of danger, right? Like, ah, my, it's my middle name, right? Danger's my middle name, right? Dan Danger Collins. It actually is. My parents are kind of weird. Uh, <laughs> James. It's James. Just so you know. But it's not that kind of cool danger that makes us want to drive fast down a straight road. James poked his head out. I was talking about my middle name, not you, buddy. But it's, it's a kind of danger that's life and death kind of danger. Christ came because all humanity, every man, every woman, every child that ever is and that ever will be, is in great, great, great danger apart from Jesus Christ. As we look at John 3.16, it's a verse, like I said, you probably have buried in the recesses of your mind. If you're anything like me, you have memorized this verse and you've memorized it in so many different versions that it just comes out as this jumbled mess sometimes, right? So we don't know if it's whosoever or who will or for God hath or has. You know, we're, we're using half old English and half modern English, right? But John 3.16, it becomes so familiar that sometimes we, we miss, right? We miss, we miss what it's saying. This is the, the danger sometimes in something becoming familiar. But when we look at John 3.16, I, I want us to read it together, all right? I want us to read this verse together. We're going to read it twice. Faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So let's read this together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Let's read it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You notice what I've underlined there and put in italics. Christ came, John 3.16 says, so that we should not perish. Right? This is the great danger that hangs over all humanity. The great danger that every man, woman, and child finds themselves in is that apart from Christ, they are perishing. 
For if Christ came that we should not perish, that means apart from Christ, we are perishing. If we remain separated from Christ, we will ultimately perish. So thinking about this and, and thinking about what this means, that apart from Christ we are perishing and apart from Christ we will perish, what I want us to do this morning is I want us to ask three questions about perishing. First I want to ask, what, what does it mean to say that we're perishing? What does, what does perishing mean? Right? Secondly, I want us to talk about why we are perishing, what has brought us to this position or to this state. And lastly, I want us to consider why we need to hear this this morning. The importance of hearing this this morning, especially on Advent Sunday. So first we're going to ask, what, what is perishing? What does it mean to perish, right? Uh, maybe to you, I don't, it seems like a little bit of an odd word, right? Perishing. Uh, usually in my vocabulary, it's kind of reserved for fruits and vegetables. Possibly milk, right? Something that will perish, something that will go bad over time. So whenever I go shopping, I always check dates on things, right? Like milk, I'm always turning around the cartons, checking out the dates on my milk, because I want to make sure I get the milk that's got the, the furthest away date, so that my milk doesn't go bad. And I don't know why I do that, because we have four kids, and I don't know if you ever been around four kids that drink milk, but it's just, it's ridiculous. It's like, you should just, I should just hook up an IV of milk to my children. They just drink it all the time, right? But perishing is usually this word that we just kind of reserve for fruits, veggies, and milk. But in our text here, this word perish has a much more devastating and destructive meaning to it, right? In John 3.16, the, the word perish means to cause or experience destruction. Right? That's kind of its, its base meaning, its, 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 its base definition. To cause or experience destruction. To ruin or destroy. Right? It's kind of what my kids do to each other's Lego towers when they build Lego towers. They just run around and smash each other's Lego towers. Destroy them. Destroy them. When we think about this word applied to humanity, what it implies is an eternal death and an eternal destruction. An eternal ruin or eternal destruction. Biblically what we see is that perishing means that one is cut off from the life of God and is attached to everything that is passing away and is contrary to life in God. In fact, John here in John chapter 3, he helps us understand more clearly what it means to be perishing, right? We think of John chapter 3, uh, a lot of this comes in the context of a conversation, right? This is Jesus having a conversation with Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to Christ at night and, and asks, and really it's kind of funny, he doesn't ask him a question, right? Nicodemus, if you look back at the beginning of John chapter 3, Nicodemus comes to Jesus with a statement, really. He says, for we know that you are from God, for nobody could do the things that you're doing if they're not from God. And Jesus seizes on this statement and just uses it as an opportunity to unpack how little Nicodemus and the Pharisees truly know about Jesus. Right? We know you are from God. And Jesus basically says in John chapter 3, you have no idea who I am, and you have no idea what it means for me to be from God. Right? And so 3.16, we have this verse about not perishing, but then John helps us understand a little bit more what it means to be perishing. If you look at John chapter 3, verse 18, just two verses down from where we are right now, the words of Christ continue in John 3, 18. And he says, Whoever believes in him, that is the Son of God, that is Jesus, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So Christ here, kind of continuing to discuss why he came, he says, Whoever does not believe in me stands condemned already. A present tense reality. You are condemned for not believing in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. And then a little further down in John chapter 3, verse 36, John is recording some words of John the Baptist. And in John 3, 36, we read, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So when we think about what it means to be perishing, and what we, when we think about what, what Christ has come to deliver us from, we, we kind of see from the rest of John chapter 3 that we can kind of sum up what it is to be perishing by saying that perishing is being under the condemnation and the wrath of God. Ultimately, when we talk about perishing, what does it mean to, to perish? We understand that perishing is to be standing under the condemnation and the wrath of God. Considering this, there are two, 
two truths, it's a tongue twister by the way, two truths that we need to understand about the wrath of God, right? If, if perishing means that we stand condemned under the wrath of God, then there's two things that we want to understand about the wrath of God this morning. First is that the wrath of God is both a, a present and a future reality. When the Bible talks about the wrath of God, God's righteous indignation, it talks about it as both a present reality and a future reality. If you look at Romans chapter 1, verse 18, Paul writes these words. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Here in Romans chapter 1, as Paul is beginning, beginning his lengthy argument throughout the book of Romans, he begins by saying that the wrath of God is revealed. This is a, a present tense reality Paul is talking about here. He doesn't say the wrath of God is going to be revealed. He doesn't say the, path of, the wrath of God has been revealed. He says the wrath of God is revealed. Literally, we could say is being revealed. It's this present tense reality, right? So God's wrath against all ungodliness and unrighteousness is this present tense reality upon which rests upon all mankind, right? Go back to John 3, 36. John says the wrath of God remains on them. Remains in the sense that it was already present and there. Paul helps us understand a little bit what this present tense reality of God's wrath looks like as he progresses through the rest of chapter 1 in Romans. And he talks about how the present tense wrath of God looks like men having depraved minds, and depraved thoughts, and depraved passions, and how God turns them over to these depraved thoughts, and these depraved passions, and these depraved inclinations. And, and it's this, this degradation, this wearing away of mankind. God's wrath is also a future reality as well. In Romans chapter 2, verse 5, Paul says this. He says, but because of your hard and impotent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves. On the day when the wrath of, I'm sorry, on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Right, so here in chapter 2, verse 5, Paul is speaking about the wrath of God, God's righteous judgment as a future reality. Right? Romans 1.18 is a present tense reality that is being revealed right now that rests upon all mankind. And then Romans 2.5, there is a future tense reality of God's wrath, a day of wrath, Paul says, when God's righteous judgment, His righteous indignation, His wrath will be fully revealed and poured out upon mankind. And so God's wrath is this present tense reality, and it's this future reality. So when we think about that in connection with perishing, then, then we can understand maybe even better now that, that when we talk about what is perishing, we can understand that perishing itself is both a, a present tense and a future tense reality as well. Right? So that we can speak of ourselves as perishing, and someday we will perish. Right? If, if perishing is standing under the condemnation and the wrath of God, then we can understand that, that now, apart from Christ, we are perishing. And if we remain apart from Christ, we will perish. We will experience the present tense reality of God's wrath, and we will store up for ourselves, Paul says, future wrath, when His wrath will be fully revealed. So first thing we need to understand about the wrath of God is that it's both present tense and future tense. Secondly, and of maybe greater importance, we need to understand that the future wrath of God is an eternal and a tormenting wrath. This is something that you don't necessarily talk about at parties, right? Uh, this is the, the kind of the, the, the backwoods conversation, you know, the, the, the hellfire and brimstone sermons that have fallen by the wayside because they're, they're too out of date for our modern sensitivities, right? But the reality of the scriptures is it cares very little about your modern sensitivities, right? The Bible cares very little about how you feel, and it cares a lot more about what is true and real in God. And, and here's the, the sad and the terrifying and the terrible reality, is that this wrath of God that the Bible speaks of is an eternal and a tormenting wrath. I saw a, uh, a Facebook uh, story, and um, it was about the Pope. All right, and it's Pope uh, Francis, I think, right? Isn't that the, the current Pope? I guess so. If you're Catholic, maybe you can let me know later on. I'm not sure. But uh, it was this article supposedly saying that the Pope had kind of come out and said that he no longer believed in hell as a, as a real reality, right? That's kind of a popular thought. It's always been a popular thought because, again, punishment's not something you really want to talk about at parties, right? 
So, this article talking about how the Pope has done away with this idea, this reality. Hell does not exist. Torment, punishment does not exist because it's contrary to a loving God, right? And on the surface, that does sound kind of great. Super, right? No hell. That's like going to class and there's no Fs, right? All right, great idea. I love this class. My favorite class, right? But the problem is that the Bible speaks of hell. It speaks of the tormenting and eternal wrath of God poured out upon mankind. And it doesn't shy away from it. And God in His providence, and God in His goodness, and God in His sovereignty, He uses the very same author who communicates the great and the deep love of God to us in John chapter 3.16 to communicate to us the terrifying reality of the wrath of God as well. You see, John wrote this gospel, and he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John too, right? Have you read those books, anybody? John, is, he's, he's, like a, he's a super lovey-dovey guy, right? He calls, he calls his people my little children. He talks about how much he loves them. He talks about how much God loves us through here, right? John, 1 John chapter 4, God is love. And God in his sovereignty, in his, in his wisdom, he uses the same author who communicates this deep and penetrating love of God to us to communicate to us the reality of God's wrath. Because John also wrote a book called Revelation. In Revelation chapter 14, we, we read these words. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Day and night, forever and ever, no rest from the tormenting reality of God's wrath poured full into the cup of his anger. The truth of the reality and the reality of God's wrath is that it is an eternal and it is a tormenting wrath. You know, I, I grew up in uh, the Bible Belt, as uh, Rob Sack pointed out. And if you're not familiar with the United States, uh, kind of geographically, the southern United States where I grew up, southeastern, is considered the Bible Belt. Where Matthew grew up in Texas, it's considered the buckle of the Bible Belt. Right? Uh, because Texas is the most important state anyway. At least they think so. Um... <laughs> That's what, they, that's what they think. But I had, you know, I had a lot of friends. Uh, we grew up, we grew up going to church, right? And that was life, and life was church, and church was part of life. It had no impact on us because we did a whole bunch of other things that we shouldn't have done. But you know, in conversations at light, when you're when you've been imbibing all night and you're kind of uh, imbibed out, um, people say stupid things. And I remember friends sometimes making comments. You know, such as, you know, so what if I, I go to hell, right? I'll be there with my friends, I have a party, I'll hang out. This kind of foolish, half intoxicated, or maybe fully intoxicated, ramblings of idiot teenage boys, right? The reality is, hell's not a party. It's not a place where you hang out with your friends. It's a place where God's righteous indignation his wrath for all eternity is expressed. And this is in no way contrary to a loving God. In fact, this is completely in line with a loving God. Because wrath is the natural, the natural reaction and the natural expectation against something that we love so desperately and so fully being maligned or mistreated or abused. I would be a jerk. I would be a horrible husband if a man assaulted my wife and I stood by and said, eh, eh. Happens. That kind of stuff happens, right? Just my life. It's cool. A loving guy does not respond. I'm a loving man. I'm not going to respond. You know, you would think I was an awful man. Because my love runs so deeply for my wife. That if she's abused or mistreated, the natural response is anger and frustration and wrath. Because something I love so desperately has been treated so inappropriately. 
What does the scripture say? God loves his glory and his name more than anything. And appropriately so, for if he was to love anything else, he would cease to be God. And we should worship that thing which he loves, but since he loves himself and because he's ultimately concerned with his glory, his name, and his praise, and his honor, he is God, and there is nothing above him. And when his glory and his name and his honor are mistreated, when they are maligned, when they are run in the dirt as if they are nothing, and the natural reaction, the expected response, is wrath. And what we see in the scriptures is that God's wrath is terrifying. And so this is the danger that all humanity sits under. We sit under the danger of the wrath of the eternal, righteous, and holy God. And this isn't, a, this isn't like a popular thing to say, right? Somebody comes up to you after sermons like this, and they say, Hey, Dan, it's a, a little too hellfire and brimstone -y. you know? Wait for you to pull out snakes and drink cyanide. That's what they do where I'm from as well. Sorry. I, I apologize for all the cultural references today. But this is truth. This is, this is what the scripture is saying. And, and in many ways, we need to stop right here. We need to stop right here. We need to realize that this is reality apart from Christ. He came so that we should not perish. And this is perishing. To rest under the wrath of God that one day if we die separated from Christ, this is reality. And the question is, do we realize the danger we're in? Do we realize the peril of our situation separated from Jesus Christ, or do we go about life as if nothing is wrong? Well, if you came here this morning under that assumption that nothing is wrong apart from Jesus Christ, that life is okay if you're separated from Christ, then please let me shatter that this morning. That if you are separated from Christ, if you are apart from Christ, everything is not okay. It is awful. And you stand but a breath away from entering into this. I used, to, um, I used to do uh, youth ministry a lot when I first started in uh, South Carolina. And uh, I hated youth ministry. <laughs> I just despised it. I was not good at it. I, I mean, I, I, know, I shouldn't say that. That's stupid. I shouldn't say that. I just didn't like it. Because, you know, it's like you've got to go skiing on ski trips and you have to go do all kinds of stuff. I didn't like planning things. I'm an awful planner. I mean, just like administratively, I'm a train wreck. And I just didn't like doing that kind of stuff. I just wanted to teach the Bible. So that's what I did. In between these little events I've got to do, I just taught. Right? And so Monday night, or Wednesday nights and, and Sunday nights, we had youth service. And I would teach for about 30 or 45 minutes. Wednesday night and Sunday night. You know, and I had other youth pastors in the area. Like, man, how do you, how do, you do that? Like, how do you stop people coming and you're just teaching? You're not playing games. You're not drinking gallons of milk. And I was like, I just do it. What am I going to do? They, they can leave if they want to leave, but I'm going to do it. Right? And when I would talk to the kids, oftentimes we would enter into the word of Christ, and, and I would labor to make sure that they understood the responsibility that now rested upon them. And, and as we come to this, this reality that apart from Christ, we're perishing, I, I pray that you understand the responsibility that now rests upon you. God's word and, and, and me as his instrument, I, we... We've left you no opportunity for escape. When, when you stand before the Lord, you will have no opportunity to say to Him, God, I had no idea I was in such danger. God, I had no idea things were so bad. I, I didn't know. Nobody told me. I wasn't aware of these things. You have no opportunity for that. God, in His grace and His providence and His kindness, He has removed that opportunity from you this very moment. Hearing these words of Christ this morning, that apart from Him you stand under the condemnation of the wrath of God, that, that apart from Christ you are in grave and great danger. You have no opportunity to say to God, I'm ignorant. For you now know that apart from Christ you are in grave and great danger. And so in light of that reality, if you have not yet, I implore you and I plead with you to run to Christ. To go to Christ. For he has come, and we should not perish. So what is perishing? It's not about fruits and veggies going bad. It's about men, women, and children standing under the wrath of God, apart from Jesus Christ. And if left apart from Jesus Christ, to ultimately endure for all eternity his righteous indignation. That is what it is to be perishing. Now the question is why? Why are we perishing? 
What has brought us to such a terrifying reality? And, and the most simple and straightforward answer is our sin. Our sin has brought us to this place. Now here's the thing, when we talk about sin, biblically speaking, I want us to talk not only about our sin, but I want us to talk about original sin as well. Because here's how God operates, and here's how the Bible tells, or here's what the Bible informs us and tells us, is that, is that uh, in the Garden of Eden, Adam stood as our representative. See, this is the one of the problems I have. There, there, there's a lot of, like, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, trends, fads, right? Coursing through the church today. Uh, Justin and I were talking about a pretty well-known uh, pastor from the United States. He's no longer a pastor now. He's just a, he's like the hip guru. He's Oprah's sidekick. And he's this uh, hip guru who just goes around surfing and, and whispering sweet nothings into people's ears, right? But, you know, he, he talks about, uh, he, some of the fads he talks about are heaven and hell being... Indistinguishable, I don't know. Anyway, but one of them is, is no real Adam, right? That's kind of a, 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 a movement in the church, that there wasn't a real Adam. That the Garden of Eden, that the Genesis story, it doesn't teach us fact, it doesn't teach us reality. It just, it's a, it's a, a story that paints a picture of what happened. But the problem is, is that if we remove an Adam, if we remove an actual physical Adam from the Garden of Eden, we, we destroy much of the theology of the Bible. Because here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that in the Garden, Adam stood as our representative. <laughs> The Bible says that in the garden, when Adam fell, all humanity fell in him. When Adam incurred guilt, all humanity incurred guilt through him. When Adam took upon himself a fallen and depraved nature, that nature was passed down through his posterity, so much so that we are born carrying his wretched and, and twisted and depraved nature in and of ourselves, so much so that the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 5, that therefore as one trespass led to condemnation for all men. He's, in Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul is outlining this reality of our connection to Adam. And he says, in Adam, condemnation spread to all men. There was a real Adam who stood in a real garden and he really sinned against God. And in his sin, all of us sinned. We inherit his corrupt nature. So we ask, why are we perishing? Because of our sin, because of our connection, primarily, well not primarily, but because of our connection to Adam's sin as well, Right? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22, in Adam all die. So we say, why are we perishing? It's because of our sin, first and foremost, our connection to Adam and our original sin. Right? But it doesn't stop there. Right? It doesn't stop there because the sad reality is that in our death and sin that we inherit from our first parents, we continue in sin and rebellion. So we're going to do a quick exercise here. It's okay. Don't be modest. I don't want any of you to be modest. Feel complete freedom here. But the camera's really focused on me, so this isn't going to be, nobody's going to see this. But just go ahead and raise your hand if you have never sinned. It's cool. Don't worry. <laughs> Feel freedom to do that. Caitlin, oh, you put your hand up? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> I saw your hand. I thought I saw your hand go up, and no. Oh, it's like, hey, no. The reality is all of us. I mean, it's a, it's a silly question because we're like, yeah, I sinned. I sinned all the way here. I sinned in the last 10 minutes. We all sin. All of us. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yes, we are connected to Adam. Yes, from Adam we inherit a depraved nature. Yes, from Adam we inherit death. But the truth and the reality is that in that death we carry on what our father did. And we carry on sin and rebellion against God, against His goodness, against His glory, against His name. And Paul is very clear when he says that the wages of sin is death. So the question is, why are we perishing? And the answer is, because we brought it upon ourselves. We are perishing because this is the sad and the terrifying reality that we have brought upon ourselves. And nothing stings so much, right? Because what we want to do is we want to hunt for somebody to blame. There must be somebody else I can blame for the reality of my situation, right? There's got to be somebody. That's the great thing about being the last of four kids, right? What's well, the great and the worst thing, right? I'm the last of four kids. So A, there's three other people to blame. B, there's three other people who are blaming me, right? So when I was a kid, I have an older brother. I have two older brothers. But my oldest brother, I was, I was a nasty, devious little child. And I like to get him in trouble, right? So what would I do? 
I would smack my cheek and rub it until it got red, and then I'd go to my mom and say, Mom, Mike hit me. My oldest brother. Ha 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 ha. Right? Tricky little me. And then my brother would literally, my mom was, like, beat the crap out of me. So, I guess it didn't really work out that well in the end, right? But we love for, we, we, we hunt for somebody to blame, right? Your mom comes in, who did this? It was him. Right? And unfortunately, at the end of the line, it was him. It was him. It was him. It was me. Our parents did it in the garden, right? I was reading that story this morning, and, and God's walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and he says, Adam, where are you? And Adam says, I'm, I'm hiding from you, God. I'm hiding because I heard you coming. I heard you coming, and I'm, I'm naked. God says, who told you you were naked? Did you eat, Adam, of the tree that I asked you not to eat? Now, now think about that for a moment. Think about that. Think about how gracious God is, how kind he is, how loving he is. Giving his son this opportunity to repent. Looking at his son and saying, son, I'm, I'm asking you, did you do it? Here's your chance, Adam. Here's, be honest, Adam. Be honest with me. I'm a loving, I'm a kind, I'm a gracious father. Have I not proven that by putting you in this amazing garden, Adam? I put you in this gracious garden. I've loved you and I've lavished these things upon you. Now, son, speak truth to me. Speak truth to me, son. Did you eat of the tree which I told you not to eat? And our father, setting the course for all humanity, was it was a woman that you gave me. You gave me this woman, she did it, she gave it to me. God looks at the woman and he says, what have you done? And she says, it was the serpent. Coincidentally, the serpent that you put here, God. Had you not put the snake in the garden, everything would have been cool. And we do that now. We read passages like Revelation, we go, no, 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 that's not me, I didn't do that. I didn't bring that on myself, that's not my fault. That's somebody else's fault. I didn't sin. I was pushed. I didn't do it. They made me do it. The devil made me do it. Somebody made me do it. But the sad reality of the scriptures is that we are perishing because we have brought it on ourselves. The wages of sin is death. We are getting what we deserve. We are getting what we have earned. We have worked and we have labored and we have, we have worked hard for our death. And God simply pays us what we deserve and what we have earned. So why are we perishing? We are perishing because of our own sin. We have transgressed his law. We have disobeyed his word. We have run his glory and his name in the muck and the mire. And because of that, we have earned for ourselves death. His righteous indignation and his righteous wrath against our sin. Paul says, for the wrath of God is being revealed against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth of so what is perishing? Perishing is to stand under the wrath of God. What, why are we perishing? We are perishing because of our own sin. And so the great question, why do we need to hear this? I mean, this is Christmas time, right? You're supposed to have a tree up in your house with lights, with ornaments, and, and music playing, and gingerbread ninja cookies. I mean, that is totally Christmas, right? That's what Christmas is supposed to be about. That's what Advent's supposed to be about. Presents, making lists, right? So who invited, who invited the killjoy to the party, right? <laughs> who, invited the, who invited the buzzkill? Sorry, I apologize, but there's great reason that we need to hear this this morning. And two reasons. Two reasons I want to give you. First is Advent is about waiting for Christ and longing for Christ. Right? I said this morning that, that we look back. Part of Advent is looking back, right? Part of Advent is looking back to the coming of Christ. Looking back to the shepherds and looking back to those who waited so long, our, our, you know, the, the Israelites under the Old Covenant waiting so long for the promised Messiah. And part of Advent is looking back at them and experiencing that, 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 that waiting and experiencing that expectation. But, but part of Advent is also looking forward, right? And it's looking forward to the return of Christ and the fact that he's coming back. And here's what the scriptures say. The scriptures encourage us to be eagerly awaiting the return of Christ. That he's looking for those who are expectantly waiting for him, who are eagerly waiting for him. And here's my contention, here's my thought, that we will not eagerly wait for Christ if we don't fully understand why Christ has come and why he's coming again. 
If we don't understand why Jesus came, if we don't understand that he came so that we should not perish, if we don't understand that he has come and he has set us free from the wrath of God, if we don't understand that he has come and he has cleansed us, he has washed us, and he has made us whole, if we don't understand that he has come and he has undone what Adam and Eve have done, then we won't long for Christ. We won't hunger for Christ. We won't thirst for Christ. These are words that the Bible uses, right? Thirst for Jesus. He comes to quench those who have a thirst. Well, what do they have a thirst for? They have a thirst for Christ. And we won't hunger for Christ. And we won't thirst for Christ. And we won't long for Christ. If we don't love Christ and honor Christ because of what Christ has done for us. So we need to hear this this morning as we think about Advent. As we expectantly long for the return of Jesus. Because our longing and our love and our desire for Christ is all bound up in understanding why Christ came. He came so that we should not perish. Secondly, we need to hear this this morning. Because there are people all over this world who are perishing. There are people all over this globe who now stand under the wrath of God. And they stand but a breath away from entering into that terrible reality of Revelation chapter 14. And I ask you, church, who is going to tell them that one has come so that we should not perish? Who is going to go to the ends of the earth and proclaim that one has come one has come so that we should not perish, so that you don't have to perish. If we don't understand why Christ came, if we don't know the danger that rests upon all humanity, then what is going to drive us and push us and move us to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ? I remember sitting in uh, like evangelism classes in, in school. And you talk about, you know, I, I, it's not so weird to say this, I hated evangelism class. Like, despised it. If you've ever gone to Bible college and or seminary and had to take evangelism class, then maybe you know a little bit about what I'm talking about. But it was like, share the gospel with eight people or you get an F. And I'm like, well, great. That's motivation. Um, but we were talking about sharing the gospel and like ways to share the gospel. And, and somebody said one time, you know, like, uh, sometimes you share the gospel and you think, well, you, you tell the gospel or tell somebody they, they need to believe the gospel because you, you'll be happy. Right? You, you need to give your life to Jesus because you'll be happy. You know what's bad about that? I've met tons of happy sinners. I've met tons of them. I don't know if you've met them. I've met tons of people who are sinning, and they're loving it, man. Life is going good, right? In fact, before I gave my life to Christ, I wasn't all that upset. I had a pretty good time now and then. I was a pretty happy dude. Telling people, hey, you come to Jesus, you'll be happy, is not a reason to tell people to come to Christ. Right? No, you won't be sad anymore. I'm not sad now. You won't be depressed anymore. I'm not depressed now. You won't be lonely anymore. I'm not lonely now. Why do we tell people to come to Christ? Not to be happy, not to get things fulfilled, not to, not to, find, not to find hope or anything. We come to people and we say, look, you're in danger. Do you understand this? That apart from Christ, you're going to die. You run to Christ not to be happy, not to be satisfied, not to, be, not, to, not to have hope or all these things. You run to Christ because you are in danger. And then in Christ, you find all these things as he sets you free. Uh, do any of you know a pen and teller? Magicians, right? Pretty cool magicians, right? Um, one of them talks all the time and one doesn't. The big guy, Penn. It's the teller. Penn's the big guy, right? Anyway, Penn's the big guy, teller's the little guy. One talks, Penn, teller doesn't say a thing. I saw this really interesting video. You can Google it if you want to. Not now. But uh, it's Penn talking about this guy who came to his magic show several times. Kept coming and coming and coming to his magic show. And the guy's a Christian. Eventually, he gave Teller uh, or Penn a Bible. Now, Penn is a, pretty much a devout atheist. Right? He pretty much, he, he states that. Like, I don't know. But he's like, I admired this guy. I, I, I thought, I, I, you know, I, I appreciated what this guy was doing. I thought, you know, here, here's a guy who really believes what he believes, and, he, and he's willing to, to, to talk about it, to come talk to me, somebody who is really a, a devout atheist. And he, and he says this. He says, because if you really believe what it says, if you really believe that, you know, it, without Jesus, you're going you're gonna to go to hell, and you're going to die. What, what kind of 
jerk do you have to be to not tell somebody that? Right? It's like, imagine if I saw a guy standing in the middle of the road and, and a truck is barreling down at him and, and, and he's unaware of it, but I see that he's about to get run over. He's like, how much do I have to hate that guy to not tell him to get out of the road? How much do I have to hate that guy to not scream, man, you're about to get run over? Eventually, I, I might have to tackle the guy to get him out of the road, but I would do it. And see, here's the problem, is sometimes we miss the point. We think coming to Jesus is about being happy, about not being lonely, about all these other things, and we forget. We forget that Christ came so that we should not perish. It doesn't say that Christ came so that we should be happy. It didn't say Christ came so that we wouldn't be lonely. It didn't say Christ came so that we shouldn't be sad anymore. Christ came so that we should not perish. Because apart from Christ, we will perish. So why do we need to hear this in Advent as we celebrate the coming of Christ? Because Christ's coming comes with a responsibility that those who love Him and know Him will go to the ends of the earth and they will make known that one has come so that we shall not perish. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you for your word. We praise you and thank you more importantly for Christ Jesus. We thank you that Christ has come so that we should not perish. And Father, I pray that you in your grace and your mercy, you would use us as ambassadors of that great and wonderful message that you would send us out to the ends of the earth so that the world might know that one has come so that we should not perish. Father, I thank you and praise you for the opportunity to pastor a church such as this. Because Father, I think of the fact that in several months, in a couple months from now, Father, some people are going to be leaving us Lord, they're going to be going out. They're going to be going back home. They're going to be going on vacation. Maybe they're going somewhere else, Lord. And I think about the opportunity to send them out, not, not to leave and not to depart, but to send them out with the gospel message. To send them out from our midst with our prayers and with our blessings and with your grace and with your mercy to go to the ends of the earth and to make known that one has come so that we should not perish. I pray, Father God, that you would put within our hearts a burning desire to proclaim the greatness and the glory of Jesus Christ. I pray that you would put within our hearts a burning desire to make known that Jesus has come, and he has come so that we might be free, so that we might have life, so that we might escape the wrath that we have earned for ourselves through our own sin and rebellion, Father. Send us out, send us all out, Father, to proclaim that one has come so we might be saved. We praise you and thank you this morning for Christ Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.